again, just to sum up really quickly, probate is the process of administering the estate when someone passes away. When someone passes away, he has belongings, he has things, and he has loved ones. And uh, someone needs to assemble all those things, use what he has in the estate to pay off creditors and the government and taxes, and then give the rest to his loved ones. Hello and welcome to Everyday Law, the show that gives you all the law you need to know. I'm your host, attorney Robert Monahan. Today we're going to be talking about probate. Now probate is a subject, it scares a lot of people. Everyone knows they want to avoid it, but they don't know exactly, I think, what it is. So people know they don't want it, but they don't know exactly what it is. So I'm here to tell you kind of what probate is and what it's all about and whether you really want to avoid it or not. So that's the first question. What is probate? Now probate comes from a Latin word meaning prove it. It's a court process of appointing someone to administer your estate, transfer the decedent's assets to heirs, and pay off debts, taxes, and expenses. So the, uh, the, decedent's, the decedent's administrator or executor is the one that um, is appointed by the court. And his job is to marshal all the assets of the estate to make an inventory of them to, to distribute to the heirs. So his first job is to figure out what do we have in this estate? What are the assets? Then his second job is to figure out what are the debts? And after he's marshaled all the assets, paid off all the creditors, his job then is to distribute what's left over to the heirs and legatees. A legatee is someone who receives a gift and then close the estate. So again, the job of the executor or administrator is to marshal the assets, figure out what all the assets are in the estate, uh, pay off all the debts and taxes to creditors and the government, and then distribute the remainder to the heirs or the people getting gifts under the will. Now, how do you decide if probate is necessary? Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. The first question you have to ask is, was there a plan in place? Did the decedent have a will in place or not? It's a very important question. If there was a plan in place, the question, the second question, is what kind of plan was it? Because there can be really two kinds of plans. There can be a will-based plan or a trust-based plan. And if it's a will-based plan, it's very likely that probate will be necessary. And if it's a trust-based plan, it's much less likely that a probate will be necessary. Now, the difference between a will-based plan and a trust-based plan that's a topic for another lecture. But for our purposes right now, just remember that if it's a will-based plan, probate is much more likely than a trust-based plan, okay? And then if there's no plan, if the decedent died without a will or a trust or any kind of plan at all, then you have to, you have to ask another question. And that question is, was there real property in the estate um, was there more than $100,000 in the estate? If there's no real property in the estate and there's less than $100,000 in the estate, uh, probate might not be necessary because there's a probate substitute called a small estate affidavit. Um, and that takes the place of a probate proceeding. It's meant for small estates, again, worth less than $100,000 and with no real property. You can only use the small estate affidavit to administer the estate if you have assets of less than $100,000 and no real property in the estate. Um, if there's more than $100,000 in the estate or there's real property in the estate, again, you're looking at probate and this is going to be an intestate probate, meaning there's no plan in place. And uh, that means uh, some, some different things than if there was a will in place. So that's the first thing I wanted to cover kind of what probate is, 
and then when you need it. So again, just to sum up really quickly, probate is the process of administering the estate when someone passes away. When someone passes away, he has belongings, he has things, and he has loved ones. And uh, someone needs to assemble all those things, use what he has in the estate to pay off creditors and the government and taxes, and then give the rest to his loved ones. And, um, and then when it's necessary depends upon the factors we just went through, okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about um, why do you need probate if you have a will? And that's an interesting question. There's a common misconception that you don't need probate if you have a will in place. Um, the people think, oh, I have a will. That means I avoid probate. And unfortunately, that's just not true. Um, a will is actually not legally effective until it's been approved by the court. It's not effective when it's signed. The trigger for a will even becoming effective is the death of the testator, the person who made the will. And even on the death of the testator, it's not automatically um, effective. The executor, appointed in the will has to go through what we're talking about, and that's the probate process. And again, what that probate process starts with is a petition that's submitted to the probate court asking the court to approve the will. And once the court approves the will, um, says that it's valid, that the, uh, the formalities were followed and so on, then the court, the probate court, will issue letters testamentary or letters of office to the executor. Um, until that happens, the executor has no authority at all. The executor can't go to the teller at the bank with the will uh, and try and get the assets of the decedent. Uh, the, the, the testator or the, the executor cannot go to the bank and ask the teller, hey, I, I have the will here. If you can see, it appoints me the executor. I'm supposed to get the assets so I can distribute them to creditors and heirs. No, the teller will say, no way, no way. What we need to see are letters testamentary or letters of office. Those are actually the effective documents, not the will itself. So to make the will effective, you have to take affirmative steps in probate court. You have to have the judge examine the will, make sure the formalities were followed, and then issue letters of office. And those letters of office are what give the executor authority to administer the estate. Um, and until that happens, the executor does not have that authority. Now, the other question, we were talking about a will-based plan versus a trust-based plan, and I wanna go into it just a little bit. Um, the simplest way to think about it is like this. Um, a trust is like a bowl that holds assets. And anything that's put into that bowl is outside of the probate court's authority. And that's why you want a trust if you want to avoid probate, because you can create that bowl with the trust instrument, the trust document, and then fill that bowl full of your assets. And once that bowl is full of your assets, uh, and, and all of them are in there, the probate court has no authority over what's in that bowl. So you don't have to worry about it. So unlike signing a will, the trust is effective immediately. And as soon as, uh, as soon as assets are put into that bowl, they're outside of the jurisdiction of the probate court. Um, so that's something you should know. The difference between a will-based plan where probate will be necessary and a trust-based plan where it won't be. As long as we're on the topic, there are other assets that are not really subject to the probate court's authority, and you should be aware of those as well. So the first category of assets that are not subject to the probate court's authority are trust assets. That's what we just talked about. Another set of assets that are not subject to the probate court's authority are jointly owned assets. Those pass by operation of law to the other joint owner at the death of one joint owner. So 
if you own a bank account with another person, on that other person's death, you become the sole owner of everything in the bank account. Everything belongs to you and you're the sole owner and the probate court has nothing to do with it. It just happens by operation of law. Okay, so there's trust assets, there's jointly owned assets and those include things like jointly owned bank accounts, jointly owned real estate, anything jointly owned is uh, not subject to the probate court's authority. And then another category is beneficiary designated assets. A beneficiary designated asset is something like a 401k or a life insurance policy. Again, these are also outside of the scope of the probate court's authority. Um, so these pass by you designating who you want to receive the 401k, the, the life insurance proceeds, whatever it may be. Again, these are outside the probate court's authority um, because they're beneficiary designated assets. They're, they pass outside of the probate court's authority. So um, one thing I want to warn you about, because um, you're listening to this probably and you're like, huh, well, I don't want probate. Nobody wants probate. Everybody wants to avoid probate. So maybe I could just joint loan everything with my, my kids. Why couldn't I put everything in joint tenancy with my kids and that way I'll completely avoid the probate court's authority. Um, then the probate court won't have any authority over these assets when I die. And uh, there's there's the issue with jointly owning things with your kids is that it's really a transfer. Um, when you put your child on the deed to your home, that child becomes a joint owner of the home and uh, there's no Indian giving there. That child then owns the home with you. And uh, if the child, for example, gets a divorce, um, his wife or husband, ex-husband or ex-wife, then has a claim on the house. It's, it's, a, it's an asset that can be, uh, can be seized on by your child's creditors. If your, if your son or daughter gets um, bankrupt by medical bills, those medical providers or the, the bankruptcy uh, trustee can go after that house as an asset of the bankruptcy estate. So be careful using joint ownership as an estate planning tool, okay? Um, and just one more caveat, as long as we're at it, on beneficiary designated assets. I mean, these include things like life insurance, 401k uh, accounts, payable on death accounts. Make sure your beneficiaries are correct. Make sure you have who you wanna have as your beneficiaries on these accounts. It's really, really important. Um, so again, um, an unplanned estate, a state without a plan. Uh, we talked about it already, um, that, uh, that a small estate affidavit can substitute for a probate estate as long as, uh, as long as the assets in the estate are under a hundred thousand dollars and there's no real estate in the estate. Otherwise, if you don't have a plan, and your assets are more than $100,000 or there's real estate there, you have to probate the estate. And if you died without a plan, it's called dying intestate. You died in the state of intestacy. And this is an interesting concept. Your legal status in the eyes of the law, if you die without a will, is you are intestate and you may not know that you're in test state, uh, but you are. Uh, the law has a lot of these legal categories, these legal statuses that ordinary people may not know about. Um, it's interesting, the law is interesting in that way. The law has these default rules. See, most people think of the law as uh, prohibitions. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to smoke pot. You're not allowed to drive 70 miles an hour over the speed limit and so on. So that's, that's how most people think of the law as prohibitions, as Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with 10 commandments and thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not cheat, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. And the law is some prohibitions, but one thing the law is as well is default rules. The law sets up certain default rules and intestacy is one of them and you may not know it. Uh, another one might be minor status. 
So when you're under 18, you're a minor and you can't own property. You can't sign a contract. You can't make a will. You can't be drafted. You can't vote. Okay. When you're 18 or when you're under 18, you have the status of a minor. Now, when you turn 18, your status in the eyes of the law changes. You're now no longer a minor. You've reached kind of legal adulthood and um, you can own property. You can make a will. You can vote. You can be drafted. You can do a lot of things that are new and different. But on your 18th birthday, I bet you didn't celebrate that fact. Uh, you probably just celebrated it was your birthday and not the fact that now you have all these legal rights that you didn't have before. And the same thing is true of intestacy in the sense that it's a category you're in and you may not even know it. You might not know you're intestate, even though you are. And let me tell you this, and I'll tell you for sure, if you don't have a will, you are intestate. Now, what's the significance of that? What, what does it mean that you're intestate? What it means is that you don't have a will and it doesn't mean that all your assets will go to the government when you pass away. But what it does mean is that you don't have an estate plan, but the government of Illinois has an estate plan for you. And that's the really interesting part. The more interesting part is that government estate plan for you is probably not what you want. It's uh, not exactly what you're looking for uh, <laughs> to make you happy in your estate. Um, let me tell you, it, it sets out uh, who can be the administrator of your estate, how your assets are distributed, and just as an aside, there's a really interesting one that just about nobody would want. Uh, that is, uh, when you uh, die without a will, the law says that if, you, if you're uh, married and you have children, your spouse doesn't get everything. Your assets are split between your spouse, who gets her share, and your kids who get their share. And it's actually awful if your kids are minors because they're, as minors, like we said, they can't control property. So if you die without a will and you're married, half of the property in your name goes to your wife, but the other half goes to your children. And if they're minors, nobody can get at it. They're held under a guardianship until they turn 18. So. That's part of the estate plan that the state of Illinois has for you. It's, uh, it's called intestacy. It's a legal status you're in, although you may not know it. And um, you probably don't want all the aspects of that plan. So intestacy is uh, probably not everything you'd want. Okay, so what about the process of probate? What are actually the steps of probate? And one of the first things I wanted to mention is that if you willfully don't file a will, if you know there's a will and you don't file it after the death of the decedent, it's a felony. Um, so it's a felony not to do that. So you have to file the will. Don't wait, file it as soon as possible. In either case, when you open the estate and, uh, and opening the estate means going in front of the judge if there's a will, to have the judge approve the will. And uh, if there's not a will, going in front of the judge and asking the judge to appoint you as the administrator. Either way, you file a petition. Um, and the petition basically says that you want to be appointed the either executor if there's a will or administrator if there's not. Um, the petition is basically, in every case, a petition is a request for an order from the judge. So a petition is asking for the judge for certain things to happen, to declare you in the order, the executor or the administrator. Um, the next thing is the oath and bond. So on your first opening of the estate, you have to file this petition that I just described, and then you have to file this paper called an oath and bond. That's another really important point about having a will that a lot of people don't actually um, know about, and that's that a will waives bond. A bond is actually insurance. It's insurance that your executor won't steal from your estate. Um, I guess the assumption is every executor might be tempted to do that. And so if you die uh, with a will, 
One thing every will does without exception almost is to waive bond. Okay, so, so your executor does not have to post and buy an insurance policy that he won't steal from your estate. However, if you die without a will, there's no way that you can waive bond. So you almost always have to post a bond when you uh, administer an estate that's intestate, that is without a will. Um, so that's one thing that you should know. Um, you're going to have to, as an administrator of an estate, an intestate estate, you have to buy an insurance policy that says you won't steal from the estate. Um, another thing that you have to file with the court when you open an estate is the affidavit of heirship. The affidavit of heirship basically lists out all of the natural heirs of the decedent. Who are they? Uh, what are their relationship to the decedent and so on. And that you have to swear that under oath and have that notarized by a notary. And of course, in an estate with the will, you have to include a copy of the will when you open the estate. And um, then, uh, then uh, but of course, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't uh, have a, a will, there's no copy. So after the estate is open, you have to send out, the, so once the estate is open, so you, uh, you file your petition, you file your oath and bond, you file your affidavit of heirship, then your court date comes, you appear before the judge, the judge examines the copy of the will or has a discussion with you if there's not, and then a few weeks later after your court appearance, you get the letters of office or letters of administration in the mail. Probably about two weeks pass, then you're appointed either the executor or the administrator and now the process starts of administering the estate. The, um, the first thing to do as the, administrator, as the administrator or the executor of the estate is take care of claims against the estate, okay? So the first thing to do is send out claim notices to all known creditors, okay? And um, so once you send out a claims notice to your known creditors, it starts the clock ticking, okay, for them to put in their claim. Um, for known claims, the creditor has to file within 60 days. For unknown creditors, and there may be some out there that you don't know about, you have to publish in the newspaper. So you publish a notice in the newspaper, you've probably seen these in, in, the, in, the, in the newspapers, that uh, probate issue, pro, the probate section, and this is the section for unknown creditors and the period you have to wait there is six months. So six months after filing, no creditor can come forth and uh, make a claim against the estate. Then you also have to send out notices to heirs and legatees. Um, so you have to send out a notice of the order appointing the executor or administrator, and you have to send out notice of independent administration and testate estate to legatees and heirs. And then, during the estate administration, you'll collect assets, make sure you have everything, prepare an inventory, get an EIN from the IRS, set up a bank account for the estate with that EIN, that tax identification number, do income tax returns or any tax returns that there may be. They, that could include income tax, estate income, estate tax, and so on. You have to pay claims that are properly presented prepare an accounting, and then prepare the final distribution. After all that is done, you can finally close the estate. What that means is you go to court, you present the final closing papers. So one of the final closing papers are receipts from all the heirs showing that they were paid. Um, you have to show the judge the proof of publication that you published in the mail, uh, that, I'm sorry, that you published in the newspaper, and then the final report that, uh, that basically informed the beneficiaries that the administration is complete. So that's the process of probate. Um, it's complicated. Um, I hope I've demystified it a little bit for you. I've had a great time talking about it and going over it. It's, uh, it's interesting and uh, there's more to it than you might think.